Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and I wanted to answer a couple of questions that were posted on my site about radon-222, radon progeny, radon washout, corium, a whole bunch of other stuff. So let me just dig right into it. It's just so much easier to say it in a video than it is to type it in the little stupid YouTube box. I apologize if I'm tired. I had a long day. Alright. Anyway, first off, corium. Corium is liquid fuel, fuel cladding, casing, materials, all the little random things, moderating materials, whatnot. They all melt into this sort of slag of sorts. Well, slag is actually melted glass, but whatever. It melts into this kind of lava of sorts, and it kind of pours out of the bottom of your melted-down reactor, and it turns into a big pool and whatnot. Sort of looks like Play-Doh coming out. Um, this happened at Chernobyl, and it's probably happened at Fukushima. I haven't read about any, but it's a melted-down reactor. I mean, you it basically has to be there, so it probably is. Um, is that, that's what happens when the reactor melts. So the question is, can corium cause an increase in radon-222? The reality is, right there, maybe. Over here in the United States, probably not. Here's the reason. It's not just a matter of the fact that it's over there and we're over here. That's for when I say we, I mean we in America. If you're on YouTube, you could be from anywhere in the world. So if you're from you know, like Germany or, you know, Istanbul or whatever, well, Istanbul's not a country, but it's a place, um, then you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what about there? Well, it's even less likely over there, but let me explain. It's not just the distance. It's the decay chain. Here's why. Natural uranium, like this, it's been decaying for billions of years billions of years. In fact, the decay, I have the decay chart right in front of me. Uranium-238, that's your basic uh, uranium, has a 4.5 billion year half-life. That means for a, subst a chunk of it, in 4.5 billion years, half of that will have decayed. Alright? Now, that decays into something, which decays into something, which decays into something, which decays into something, and it's constantly happening. So it's like an assembly line, if you like. So you start, but, but they decay at different rates, so you start to get different concentrations of them. More of this one, less of this one, because this one decays rapidly and this one takes a long time. And you get something called an isotopic equilibrium. And to put that in plain English, what that means is, if I'm looking at natural uranium, I expect to see that there's probably about this much of this, and this much of that, and this much of this, and so on. To give you an idea, I'm going to show you a spectrum. And if you look at the spectrum, on your far left, you're going to see a peak from my x-rays, of course, that comes out of my own machine. But then you're going to see the four fingers of uranium. And the first one, from your perspective, on the uh, far left will be radium-226. Then the next three after that are going to be lead 214. Then far past the middle, going to the right, you're going to see another hump, and that's bismuth 214. These take a long time to get to, and they exist only in natural uranium. In fact, let me tell you what you have to go through first, and let me tell you the half-life to get to it. Uranium 238, four and a half billion years. Thorium 234, 24 days. Pro, uh, protactinum, protactinium, why do I always say that protactinum? Protactinium uh, two, uh, 234 M, which is a metastable isomer, 1.2 minutes. Uranium-234, bam, it comes to a stop at 240,000 years, so a quarter million years on that one. Then whatever's come out of that becomes thorium-230, 77,000 years. Then, then you finally get radium-226, and that in itself is 1,600 years. Then that decays to radon-222, which is 3.8 days, and then you move into the quick chain that becomes radon decay. Um, that would be radon-222 to uh, polonium-218, 3.1 minutes. Lead-214, tw uh, lead 27 minutes, it becomes bismuth-214, 20 minutes, it becomes polonium-214, 160 microseconds. Then it gets down, it decays to lead-210, where then it comes to another stop for 22 years. Then it becomes bismuth-210 for 5 days, polonium-210 for 140 days, and then lead-206 stable. What I'm trying to say is, this thing has to go through like millions of years before it generates enough radium-226 and bismuth to be worth anything. The reality is is that if you take uranium and you um, remove all that from it, which they do at, at fuel plants and stuff like that, you know, they, they, they come out with basically just uranium dioxide or something to that effect that's been enriched with a certain amount of 235 to 238, all the leads and the bismuth and the plenums, they're all gone. I mean, there's probably trace amounts, but for the most part, they're gone. 
and it's going to take a long time for the equilibrium to come back. Some of it will come back reasonably fast, it'll start to appear reasonably quickly, and in reality I think it's only a few decades until it's actually built up enough that some uh, really sensitive device like mine would be able to detect it worth anything. And here's a, here's a, here's a spectrum of natural uranium. Okay, now I want you to compare that to this. This is a spectrum of depleted uranium. You notice they look completely different, and they're gonna look different. <clears throat> Most importantly, there's not enough uh, radon-222 to shake a stick at. So yes, it does produce it. Hitting the groundwater, I don't even know if it has hit the groundwater, I don't think it has. But, you know, what I know, I don't know anything, if it has hit the ground water, let's just say it hit it and just blew up all over the place, it wouldn't matter. Now, you could have all kinds of things all, uh, flying all over the place, but you wouldn't have radon flying all over the thing. And you see, these theories are, are great and everything, but the problem is they, they usually follow a sequence of logical events, and then they hit like a hole. They're discontinuous. And then you kind of like make a jump. That's where the jump occurs. Isotopic equilibrium is not there. Um, the other thing that I, I have a problem with with that theory is that it would all rain down in St. Louis. I don't know what's up with that. I don't know why all the radon washout like in the entire world shows up only there. I, I don't I don't get it because uh, everyone else I know that's searching around here, we, we're just not finding this sort of stuff. We're finding it, but we're not finding that, not thousands of counts. But maybe it does show up. Maybe there's some unique weather phenomenon that deposits some... Uh, hundreds of times the amount right there in a couple other random places. What I know, I'm not a meteorologist, <clears throat> all I know is that corium can't be doing it for that particular reason. Not because it's not there, it's definitely there, I mean you have melted down reactors so you have corium. Well the corium is not really a proper thing anyway, it's just kind of a name that scientists have given to melted goo that was at one point a uh, set of fuel rods and suspension etc. Um, let's see, have I gotten everything yet? Oh yes, I just remembered. Announcements. I have completed another experiment, a really crazy one. We're going to see what the results are on that, um, but I will say no more about the crazy experiment. It's kind of neat though. And um, tonight, supposedly, we're going to have more rain, and if I can collect some rain, then I will throw it in the machine and see what I get out of it. Who knows? Maybe I'll get something. Maybe I won't. But anyhow, uh, this has been Tom from anti-proton.com and um, don't mean to offend anybody or anything like that but I'm just saying that some of the stuff doesn't match up with science it sounds good but it doesn't match with science and now what can I say